It's a great pleasure to honour the memory of um, one of Ireland's greatest scientists, John Desmond Bernal. Um, so I guess I, I thought I would say maybe a few words to explain why John Desmond Bernal. Um, well, first of all, he was known in the family as Desmond. Um, this we learned in the very recent past. Um, he's Irish. He's local. Um, his father, um, Samuel Bernal, was a graduate of the Albert Agricultural College in Dublin, which of course became NIHE Dublin, a sister NIHE to ourselves in Limerick, and has since become DCU. And of course we regard DCU very much as being a kindred spirit in the university spectrum in Ireland. Um, so that's one little link. Um, his mother was um, Elizabeth Miller. She attended Stanford University in the, in, in the USA. And after a period in Australia, um, um, Samuel Bernal bought the family farm in Brook Watson in Nina, which is currently being operated by Christopher Lind, um, a descend direct descendant of Desmond Bernal's. It was a big enterprise. It employed 20 people at the time. It supplied milk to Nina. That was one of, one of the things which he did. But Desmond Bernal was educated by his mother. Um, his first formal education was with, um, um, with the nuns in Nina. I guess when you're a certain age in Ireland, we've all been to the nuns for our <laughs> first education. Um, there's a mention of a school in Barrick Street in Nina as well, in his biography. And he, he went to the UK for a second level education, um, attended um, Emmanuel College at the University of Cambridge, graduated in 1923. He worked in the Royal Institution. He was a director of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. And he became the professor of physics at the Birkbeck College of the University of London in 1937. And there he spent a lot of his professional life. So he was an active scientist between about 1920 and 1970, shortly before he died. Um, so more precisely, what did he do as, as a scientist? Um, well, Desmond Bernal contributed to the development of the theory and practice of X-ray diffraction. Um, one of the most powerful techniques available to modern science to determine um, molecular structure. So let me explain for a moment. Um, every secondary school student in Ireland um, who's studying science, and I guess most secondary school students study science, um, sooner or later, and indeed any secondary school student in the world, um, they'll be ex some, uh, their teacher will explain to them the difference between graphite and diamond. They're both made from the same element, carbon. Um, one of them, graphite, is black. It looks a bit like soot. Um, it's soft. It's cheap. And if you're scribbling with a pencil, you're using graphite. Because the lead in the pencil is actually graphite and not lead. Um, the other is bright, it's hard, it's highly valued in engineering and we'll say for decorative purposes. Um, so Desmond Bernal carried out the seminal X-ray work to determine the two-dimensional structure of graphite, um, which explains all of its properties because if it's, it's a two-dimensional structure, it's layers of carbon atoms which slide over one another and this largely determines its, its properties. Whereas diamond is a three-dimensional network of atoms, all joined together. So that's one of the things he did. Just one of the very first things which he did. Um, he carried out the seminal work on hydrogen bonding structure in water, for instance. And how important is that? But extra diffraction techniques which he worked on have led to our understanding of simple things like why blood is red or blue, depending on the your state of health. <laughs> um, it explains um, why grass is green. Um, it explains for us how water is absorbed by soils, absorbed and released by soils. Um, why bones are strong, why wax is soft. So these are the, he worked right at the very start of these techniques. But probably his biggest contribution to science was the application of X-ray techniques in the field of molecular biology. When he started, that field didn't exist. He didn't know he was inventing molecular biology. Um, 
And molecular biology is the branch of science whereby the structure and composition of the most complex biomolecules, proteins and enzymes, are determined. When he started in the 1930s, um, the world, including himself, cannot have known how complex these materials were going to turn out to be. Um, so it must have been a daunting task for him to move, to move from simple structures like graphite to hugely complicated structures like proteins. I guess he didn't know what he was undertaking, but he did it. Not only did he do this work, but he did it in the most extraordinarily generous manner. And this is one of the things that comes across when you read about Bernal. He had a vision to open up vast new areas of scientific research and the generosity of spirit to pass these areas to others without ever claiming credit or jurisdiction. Many of his students and co-workers won Nobel Prizes for work that he started and generously handed over to them. So, for example, Max Perutz won the Nobel Prize in 1962 for determining the structure of hemoglobin, the thing that makes your blood red or blue. And he said, I started my X-ray work on crystalline proteins in the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge under J.D. Bernal, in 1937, just after he and Dorothy Hodgkin had demonstrated that protein crystals can be made to yield sharp X-ray diffraction patterns. So he was right in it, really, really in it to start with that work. His student, Dorothy Hodgkins, won the Nobel Prize in 1964 for the structure of vitamin B12 and later for her work on the structure of insulin. Um, and she says his greatest gift was his ability to inspire others. So, J.D. Bernal's work contributed to the Nobel Prize winning work of many other scientists, including Watson and Crick for their work on DNA, um, and I guess Rosalind Franklin as well, for Kendrew, for Klug, and indeed Kathleen Lonsdale was a, was a student of his as well. And we have a building in the campus already called after Kathleen Lonsdale. So from that work, now there are 20,000 unique protein and enzyme structures known. And, these, and this knowledge forms the basis of hundreds of new medicines which are in development. I should also mention that um, Professor Bernal during the Second World War acted as a consultant to Lord, Mo Lord Mountbatten and he um, played a role in the planning of the D-Day landings. So he was quite a, quite, quite, a, quite, quite a person. We had the very great pleasure of inviting the Bernal family to the university um, some weeks ago and we got to know the family very well, and it was a very great pleasure to speak with um, Caroline Bernal, who's, who's Desmond's granddaughter. And she recount, recounted, recounted how um, she used to go to his um, laboratory in London from time to time, play with his models, because these structures always involved models and so on. And the word which she used was the generous nature of the man as, 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 as her grandfather. And that's something which comes across again and again, his sheer generosity. He's probably the most generous person that I've ever kind of read about in, in, in the history of science. Um, we also had another extraordinary um, revelation on that evening. Um, seated in the front row here, we have Mr. Jack Paul, who's a friend of the family. Um, and he only met Desmond Bernal once. So if I might recount your story, if you don't mind. Um, so I'll, um, he came to us and... Jack is 100 years old. Met. So he met Desmond Bernal once, that was in 1950. And at that meeting, um, Desmond Bernal um, explained to him all about what would happen with global warming. This was in 1950. He said pollution would lead to a rise in temperatures, Polar ice caps would melt, the seas would rise, and, um, and predicted the kind of catastrophic effect it would have on the weather and so on. This was in 1950. Now, I wasn't born in 1950, but I'm sure I didn't hear anything about global warming <coughs> until well into the 80s or the 90s. So this was 63 years ago. It's extraordinary the, the, the insight and foresight which he had. So, just turning over to a moment, I, I, on the Bernal project and where we've been working on the project actively for the last two, two and a half years. We're moving ahead with architects and so on, our buildings and the colleagues and buildings and estates um, in terms of 
putting up the building. We've been through the design stage and the, building, the construction has started. We have 10 suites of laboratories, specially constructed, state-of-the-art laboratories. Um, I'd like to thank our colleagues from HR and also our, the many colleagues from all over the world who have helped us in our recruitment campaign to recruit some of the very best um, scientists and engineers to come to work with us here in, in Limerick. Um, and all of the, that, that stuff is on track and it's going to be a very exciting future. And, um, but finally, I'd just like to say, as, because I'm standing in front of you here as a scientist and as a, an Irish scientist, and, um, so it gives me deep satisfaction that we're honouring the memory of one of Ireland's greatest scientists. Um, and on behalf of the entire scientific community in Ireland, I want to thank all of those who have played a role in bringing this about. In particular, I want to thank the President of the University of Limerick, who's been who's championed this um, project since its inception. <coughs> I want to thank Atlantic Philanthropies and the University of Limerick Foundation for their generous support. I'd like to thank um, SFI, Enterprise Ireland, and those who have already identified the importance of this project and the, the role which it can play in the national research agenda. And finally, of course, I want to thank the government and people of Ireland for their continued support. And thank you all for your attention.